One thing missing from your bio that I just wanted to start up by saying is that you may not realize it, this kid from Brooklyn, diehard uh, Chelsea football fan, and it looks like you're about to win. We won. You're we done. Won. Yeah. Yeah, so you're we feeling pretty league. good. Yeah, we did well. You happy about that? Yeah, I am happy. Get some satisfaction from that. Um, I lived in London for six years, so that's, that's my team. And, uh, and soccer played a big part of you getting to American Express. So can you just give everybody <laughs> a, um, a little bit that? of a background on why soccer became so important to you? Yeah, I did. I grew up in, in Brooklyn uh, on the outskirts of Park Slope. And so Prospect Park was our, was our playground. And um, you know, it was a borough of immigrants. It still is. It still is. And um, you know, when I used to go as a kid to the park, I used to play soccer a lot. So I, I, I gained a love for the game. Got was pretty well, did a pretty good job at it, was captain of my high school team. And, um, you know, I was deciding what I wanted to do for a career. No one, in, no one of my friends were going to college. I took a year off out of high school, worked, said I got to get out of Brooklyn, um, looked up a school uh, in Florida. I just said, let me go to Florida. I have some criteria. Can I play soccer down there? Is the weather nice? And what's the male to female ratio at the school? <laughs> Uh, found a school, never had been to, University of Tampa, called them up, struck a deal that if I made the soccer team, they would pay for my room and board, and I would just have to pay for tuition. So I went down there, made the team, off to a great start, three games into the season, uh, tore up my knee, lost my scholarship, had to come back, and um, I was doing a variety of part-time jobs because I was working through college, got into NYU, and in the cafeteria of the NYU, I found a, a posting for a two-week temporary assignment at American Express uh, and took the job, and I've been there ever since. And so how about that, guys? That's uh, quite a career. <laughs> um, so, you know, in a career that spans <clears throat> decades, and how have you had to reinvent yourself at that same organization? No, it's, it's cool, because it doesn't feel like, I mean, it's a long time I've been there. Uh, but it doesn't feel that way. And when I, I talk to people, I, I say, I feel like I've had at least 10 different careers working at American Express, working different cities, whether, you know, starting in New York, being in New York now, but I worked in Chicago, worked in Arizona, worked in London, worked in different businesses, had, you know, 15 different bosses during my career, saw American Express from every angle possible. So I never felt I was in the same place doing the same thing for too long. Every few years, I got the opportunity to do something different. Sometimes it's a promotion, sometimes it was a lateral. But I really felt I was able to stay fresh and learn new things, meet new people, solve different problems. And I love that. And the, thing, the one thing that was pretty consistent no matter where I worked in the company was the culture of American Express. Um, is very strong. I mean, it's focused, do the right thing for the customer, treat people the way you want to be treated. So I felt very comfortable in the culture, but I really feel like I've had 10 different careers and always the opportunity to learn something different. And I think that's the key thing, is having the right mindset, looking, looking for something new, never feeling like, even though I've been here for you know, uh, 30 plus years, that I know the answer. Because I think as soon as you feel like you know it all, that. In my mind, that's a yellow flag that says that's the road to becoming obsolete, mm. right? So there's always something, even though you're tack we're tackling similar issues, depending on the day of the week that I've seen before, but the answers are changing, right? Because customer needs are changing, technology's changing, regulation's changing, economic environment is very different than it was. So, um, you know, it's just that constant quest for learning, trying different things, meeting new people. Um, and uh, learning as I go. I think that a lot of people in our audience, are, they're coming from the marketing perspective of a financial service company, and um, it, it's, we talked a lot about disruption today and people who want to get into your own business. American Express, 165-year-old company, how do you keep a growth mindset in a company this old? No, it's, it's pretty cool, 165 years old. And the only way you get to stay 165 years old is to reinvent yourself. So that comes with the territory. And I think uh, we have a good history of doing that. And sometimes you do it proactively. 
you know, you see change coming and you want to get in front of it. And sometimes you do it reactively because shit happens, right? <laughs> and it causes you to take a different tact. And I've seen both sides of it, trying to get out in front of, a, of the curve, try different things. We know that consumer behavior is changing because of technology and mobile uh, and how people shop, buy and pay for things are changing radically over the course of five years. Um, you want to get in front of that, but we also dealt with you know, events of 9-11, the Great Recession, other things during the course of the year that forces you to relook at things. So I, again, I think uh, you know, the key is ha a growth mindset, I believe, is a conscious choice that you make. You make as an individual and you try to instill in your organization to work hard, assume positive intent, a, a real thirst for learning, for doing something different, and trying things, and not being, not being afraid when something doesn't work right, right? And, you know, because it's a great opportunity to learn. So, and I, I use, you know, the term failure carefully, because it's not a failure to try something and it fails. It's only a failure if you give up, you don't learn from it, or you accept mediocrity. That's a failure. So trying different things and making sure you create an environment where people feel safe taking a risk, that their career is not gonna be killed because they tried something high profile and it didn't work. It's, it's that constant quest for what do we learn so we can get better the next time. And, and you know, I can't say it's, I don't exhibit that every day. I try to be conscious of it. You know, our organization doesn't exhibit every day, but we try hard, right? And try very hard to keep that top of mind. Do you feel warmed up right now? Do you feel like I can get into get the uh, rough yeah. question yeah, right yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Take right. your best shot. All right. I pre-cleared this with him. <laughs> Two setbacks this year, and they're pretty biggies. The uh, partnership with Costco ended, and um, a judge ruled in favor of the Department of Trust uh, d Justice over an antitrust case. Yeah. So how do you deal with that kind of stuff? I mean, that's, that's, that's out there, and how do you personally deal with it? And as an organization, how do you get beyond it? Yeah. So, you know, uh, two very different things. This thing with Costco, which was public because we had to explain it to our employees and we had to explain it to our partners, we had to explain it to our investors and to the financial community because Costco was the biggest commercial relation, is the biggest commercial relationship American Express has and we'll have it until the middle of next year. And it's a 14 plus year relationship. And it's very big. We gave some numbers when we talked about this decision that we were not renewing our, our contract with Costco. Is that you know it's eight eight percent of our global billings, and you say okay eight percent. Well, our global billings last year as a company was one trillion dollars. Mm. Eight percent of a trillion is a big number. Eighty billion, for those of you without a calculator. Thank you. That's a big co-brand. It's the biggest co-brand card in the payment industry, probably in the world. Um, and it took us 14 years of building it, a great partnership, but stuff happens. And, uh, you know, I, I have a long experience in the B2B side of American Express, whether, you know, uh, in our corporate card business or travel business working with companies, and whether it was a procurement director who we had a relationship with and a new person came in and our relationship was at risk, or the CEO of Costco retiring and someone new coming in who had a different view, who didn't look for a partnership, look for something different. Um, you know, we, we saw this coming and, um, and, you know, we decided at the end to stop pursuing it uh, in a bid process, uh, not just because the returns were dropping fast, which they were, it was a very competitive marketplace now, much more competitive in the card industry than it's been in a long time, maybe ever. Uh, but because the opportunity cost of winning it was growing. So in other words, if we retain that contract at a low margin, we're going to need more people, time, resources, investment, technology spend, you know, and it was a 10 year plus commitment, it would have prevented us from investing in every other part of the business. So once we realized the math, not just, you know, competitive situation here, but the opportunity cost of not investing or investing less in every other part of the business that has a higher return, we said we have to, we have to part ways. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to explain, and our stock got beat up. And it's, you know, it's, it's, we're one of the, 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 the worst performers on the Dow this year as a result. And then two weeks after that, you know, we've had a case going on with the Department of Justice for over four years now. We lost the first round, and that's in our contracts with merchants. And that we have a provision in every one of our merchant contracts that asks merchants, if you accept American Express, don't discriminate against our card members. When they come in, don't ask them if they have another card. 
we put that in, in our way of, of doing business. And those have been in our merchant contracts since the 1960s. So uh, the Department of Justice uh, won the first round that says that's anti-competitive, that merchants should be free, free to steer. The difference is Amex doesn't have the share of Visa and MasterCard. So we, would, we feel that we have to protect our business models. Our choice, but we decided uh, four years ago the DOJ sued Visa, MasterCard, and Amex. They settled on day one because they do have market power. We decided to fight it because settling it would have been akin to losing. So um, it's it's never great to be sued by the U.S. government. Mm. It's worse. Yes, in fact, to they've lose got the deep, first they round. even have deeper pockets than American Express. <laughs> yes, than maybe the one entity. <laughs> That's right. They don't mind if their legal bills uh, go up. They they're not held accountable for mm. a PNL. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but we felt, you know, if we don't stand up for ourselves, who will? Mm -hmm. It's profit halal. If, if, <laughs> if we don't stand up for ourselves now, when? Right? So we feel like you know, we have to protect our business model. And yeah, it was a setback. But we knew it was going to, the first round would be 50-50. And we lost that. But uh, we don't regret fighting it. And now we'll go to the second, uh, second round, which is the Court of Appeals. And it could take another year or two for this to, to, uh, to work itself out. But uh, so to answer your question, though, those were the two big news items around Amex in really the first two months of this year. And our stock did get beaten up a little bit. And, you know, but like I said, we faced challenges before. Um, so I don't want to downplay that because those, that's big. And it's, it's negative news. But we've, I've seen the challenges Amex has faced, you know, whether it was what we did coming out of 9-11, because we were right across the street when the North, the North Tower fell into our building. We had 11 employees killed. The business I was running, we lost, uh, you know, we, I lost 11 employees, but the business was decimated. It was corporate card and travel. People weren't traveling. Went from the highest growth business to minus 75% revenue growth in, um, in a week. Um, and I saw what we did, you know, obviously part of the architect. How do you re respond to that? And that's life and death. This isn't life and death. We went through the Great Recession and had to rejigger the whole company and rebuilt it to be, remain a growth company. So what I've learned in those examples that this is not like either one of those. This is not life-threatening to the company. Um, but what defines you as a leader and what defines the company is not that event. It's what you do to respond. And it's all about how you respond, how can you rally your company to keep people focused and energized and feeling good when you have bad news and you're dealing with stuff you've never seen before. We've never lost a co-branded card, let alone $80 billion one. We've never lost one. So what do you do? There's not a playback book, right? We don't have a navigation system that says turn right at this corner. You have to figure this out as you go. But you, know, you, have, you have principles and values that guide you, right? That we want to be a growth company, right? We want, we want to find ways to win. We want to ensure we're investing in the core of our company, right? We want to be relevant for not just this generation of customers, but the next generation to come. And that's what we're focused on. So I have to say the organization responded well, right? Uh, you get angry. Personally, you know, you have to go through, you know, the anger, fear, resentment, right? And get to embrace the future. And, you know, I had a day to get through that. Oh, that's good. You gave yourself a day off. That's good. <laughs> well, let's talk about a little bit more of the future. Yeah. Um, you've got great partnerships that are being launched all the time. Um, can you explain that deal with fitness tracker Jawbone? Yeah. All those funny people wearing their stuff. How on earth does American <laughs> Express partner with those guys, and what are you trying to do? Well, I mean, this is all under the category of learning about how consumers will shop, buy, and pay for things now and in the future with the advent of wearables and mobile phones. So what we did with Jawbone is coming soon in the, in the early summer, uh, Jawbone will sell an Amex band, they're, uh, they're up four, and it will have a chip in it, like the iPhone has a chip in it, and, and you can load your card in the Up app, and you can just tap and pay at any place where NFC is accepted. So any place you can use Apple Pay, um, you can use Jawbone, um, maybe even more places. It's just a way for us to learn. And what's cool about that is you think, I mean, there, there is a use case here, right, is that you're out exercising, right? Maybe you have your phone, maybe you don't have your phone with you, but you have your jawbone on because you're competitive with your friends on how many steps you've taken today. Mm -hmm. And you can buy it. You can walk up to any place where there's an NFC terminal and just tap and pay. It's really cool. It's simple. It's 
blazingly fast. It's under a half a second authorization time. Um, do I think we're, this is going to take on Apple Pay? Not at all. I, we're, and we're not, our goal isn't to try to do that, but it's to try to test and learn. And you know, we, we've done well working with Apple Pay, and our customers is a big overlap of Amex customers and people who love iOS. Uh, and we wanted to make sure we had a very seamless implementation of Apple Pay. And I think, you know, I'm not the most objective person, but hearing from Apple and others, we probably had the best implementation. We have some unique things about Apple Pay you can't get with our competitors. Um, we experienced by far the lowest fraud rates, not just on Apple Pay, but in the card industry. But our goal is not to be tied to the piece of plastic, which a, th a few years ago, people you know, who were critical of Amex, or maybe credit cards in general, say plastic's going away, you're all gonna be commoditized, or you're gonna be dis disintermediated. And I think we've navigated that whole phase of the last three or four years really well, focusing on the customer, saying our value proposition is not tied to the color of your plastic. People like the, the, their Amex cards they have, and each one has a different card that they like for different reasons. But what stands behind every Amex card is, and whether it's a plastic or a click to buy or tap and pay, is trust, service, and security. And that's, that's inherent in the Amex brand, and our goal is to build that because that's even gonna be more important whether it's Jawbone or or Apple Pay or Samsung Pay or whatever comes down the road, that we keep that value proposition alive. And I believe that's, that's a huge advantage that Amex has earned over time, and our goal is to continue to invest in those things. How do you manage that brand as it uh, sort of speaks to different generations? In other words, you know, you've got a certain cohort of which I am now a part. Um, Thank that, you. That, um, understands Amex in a way that is, this is sort of the, the elite brand. And then you've got a millennial generation who doesn't really care about a black card or a platinum card. Or, and, and so how is your messaging tailored to take advantage of each of those generational views? No, I, th I think it's being aware of what our brand stands for and knowing that it needs to evolve. It can't be static. And like I said, there's many elements of a brand that will remain whether this was 20 years ago or 20 years from now of trust, service, and security have to resonate because that's important to everybody regardless of your age, right, or the things you do every day. Uh, those things, I think, ring true. Um, but I think we have to stretch the brand. I think there's many good things about the American Express brand from the research we do, and our customers love our brand, but people who are not our customers may think it's not right for them. There are things they like about the company, but they may feel it's, you know, it's, it's for when you've arrived, or maybe we've turned someone down earlier who applied for a card, or maybe they say, well, I'll never pay a fee for a card, and I want a credit card, and Amex only has charge cards, all of which is wrong, but that's perceptions that are out there. So we, we keep thinking about how the brand has to evolve. And like you said, it's elite, it could have elitist feel to it, and we that's not what we're striving for. What we're striving for is aspiration. Right, that where it's, it, it always has been a symbol of success, but we want it instead of being that you've arrived, that Amex is there for your journey, and that we can stretch it to appeal not just to the 50-year-old, and there's not that you would know, Jill. No, there's of course. nothing wrong with the 50-year-olds, <laughs> right? Who we'll use me, their right? Amex cards. Exactly. Um, but when you look, you, our, our aspiration to be a growth company, we have to look five, 10 years down the road, and we have to appeal to those under 30 as much as we do today to those uh, who are 50-something years old. And I think we're, we're doing that. We're learning as we go. Again, there's not a playbook for this, but we're learning as we go. And if you look at our last three or four years, you could sync your card with Facebook or Twitter. You could validate a review on TripAdvisor, you, syncing your Amex card to that. You get digital offers that you could swipe your card and get a credit on your statement. You can pay for a New York City taxi using your membership reward points right at the point of sale, or McDonald's, go into the Uber app, and you can pay for a ride using your membership reward cards if you sync your card. Um, and there's more to come of things we're doing to really push the envelope. And it's really dealing with the edges of our, you know, of our customers. Many of the 50-year-olds don't want to link, link their card with Facebook. 
but the 30-year-olds don't think twice about that. So we're learning as we go, and we're planning not just for the business as it exists today, but what it will look like in five or 10 years. And that's, and that's the fun part. And you know it was great? Um, I was speaking to Brad Miner, who works with you before this, and we were talking about, you know, the, I said, you know, like, your generation, you guys want to share everything, and I'm giving him this whole thing. And he used a great term. I just want to credit him for saying that. Um, he says that millennials will, per, will grant um, the permission to be creepy, like we'll grant you the permission to be creepy, but they want something in return. And, um, and, and one of the things that he said that struck me really was very interesting is that the company has to know who that customer is. Like you can't be sending me a bunch of nonsense that I don't need. No. So how do you distill what they need and what they don't need? Well, you know, and one, we, we and many other companies historically have been guilty of spamming you or dropping a lot of stuff to you that's not relevant. And you know that's the direct marketing of the past. Uh, the future is very different. It's about knowing your customer. And I, you know, it's, I can only speak to American Express's business and to our customers. And I think our customers give us permission to be creepy, Brad. Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to get to be creepy, uh, meaning that our customers expect us to know them. And that's a high bar because they don't want us to send things that are not relevant. They, but they're, they're way open to saying, you know, show me something that you think I would like. And the fact that you may know what I like is okay as long as we don't abuse that or we don't share that inappropriately with a third party, right? That we focus on using information and in what we call our closed loop data that we know a lot about our customers. We know a lot about the merchants who accept the card. Uh, we use that to service our customers better, like to identify fraud early, which is a major issue in the card business, uh, and protect our customers. But we also have to use it to offering content to our, to our customers based on what we think they may like. And that's an iterative process, learning as you go. And the more we can do that and have one-to-one -one connections with our customers, the more I think we'll succeed in the future. It's reinventing loyalty. That has to be reinvented because many parts of the credit card business have been commoditized. And you know, we believe it's our job as leaders to reinvent how we build connections with our customers and to go where they are. So this whole thing about you know, whether you're on the Uber app or in New York City taxis or at McDonald's, we're trying to find ways to surprise and delight our customers where they are find you on your journey in the real world or in a digital world and try to create something unique. Try to bring something that Amex has to life, like our membership rewards program, in a place you wouldn't expect it. And like I said, I think we've learned a lot, but we're only at the very early days of kind of reinventing loyalty. And speaking of loyalty, this week you rolled out your new Plenty program. I got about a thousand different <laughs> messages from different people about it. Um, it so I'm the Macy's, Rite Aid, ExxonMobil, Hulu, and Nationwide Insurance. There's probably some more. There's a few more, but that's, what, a, good, that's a good collection right what there. What is this program? How does this reinforce your brand? What, I mean, that's really what I'm, like, you do this program, you're rolling it out, but what does it do for you, Amex? Well, first, it's, well, you, you won't see the Amex brand. Now, Amex will have uh, a co-branded credit card called Plenty. So if I back up, we, we launched a coalition of merchants in different categories of spending, like Exxon and Macy's and Rite Aid, et cetera, as Jill mentioned, and they're pooling their rewards program. Many of those companies had their own rewards program. And in fact, something in the US, like an average US consumer, is enrolled in 27 reward programs and uses eight of them or something like that. Um, and we felt, we've seen this, in fact, we bought a company five years ago in Germany that ran a program in Germany, same thing, coalition loyalty, we call it, and 50% of the households now in Germany are collecting points. But what it is, if you peel the onion a little bit, we have these great brands and different categories of spending, pooling the rewards so you can earn points at Exxon and use them at Rite Aid and vice versa. So each, each merchant's own loyalty program is strengthened. Amex runs the platform, and it's performance marketing. So the partners come to us, we have all the data, and we help them figure out ways to grow their business. There will be tens of millions of collectors over the course of the next year in the US of this program. And we have you know, the ability now of marketing on behalf of those merchants to, to target personalized relevant offers from those different merchants to customers, depending on what each merchant is trying to achieve. Amex, it's a big day to play. 
A lot of it will be on mobile, and it's about helping those merchants grow their business, improve their loyalty with their customers. We run the platform, and we get compensated if we meet the, the goals of the merchants. It's not branded Amex, it's branded Plenty. So, and Plenty was trending this week, wasn't it? It was the top trending app in the, uh, in the Apple Store in the App Store for a few days this week, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, given that it was launched within the first, within the hours of the launch, I searched in the App Store for Plenty, and Plenty was number three. Under the word Plenty, we were number three app. Within a few hours, we were the top trending app in the, in the, in the Apple Store, and the App Store, and all the, these merchants, so if you walked into a Macy's or a Rite Aid, you're gonna see the branding all over. You won't see the Amex brand. Maybe as one of the partners, you'll see it. So this is not about the Amex brand. It's an adjacency we know, loyalty marketing. It's a big day to play, right? It's, it's focused on merchants. So Amex, you know, everyone knows American Express generally for our relationships with our card members, that we're a card issuer and we obsess about customer experience and net promoter scores. But we also care deeply about being relevant to the merchants who accept the card. Uh, and we have to, when you run a network, a closed loop, you have to add value on both sides. So we do have a lot of expertise of marketing with merchants. So, and when we, you linked your card with Facebook, you know, we would send you merchant offers to, to, you, to you based on your social graph. Merchants now were, incredibly impressed that they could come to Amex and we could market them on social media. So now we're just taking this at scale now and these merchants have given us their crown jewels, their loyalty program, and they said, Amex, you run this for us. Um, and that's a very uh, high responsibility that we take seriously. But I think it's, it's, it's a very good business for us in a space that we're comfortable with and it helps our strategic goal of adding value to all these merchants. Uh, so we're looking forward to it. It's off, I mean, I won't, I won't quote numbers because I'm probably not allowed to, but we're off to a very good start three days into this. It's That's amazing. I, I want to shift gears um, in the time remaining because despite his exterior white guy of a certain age, Ed is passionately interested in talking about diversity. And I, I just, I mean, look, you joined Amex at a time where they weren't exactly like doing big time uh, attraction and retention of uh, sons of Irish immigrants. Uh, so I want to know in, in this massive company with hundreds of thousands of employees, um, how do you create a culture that is diverse? Well, I think, you know, and there's a couple of ways I'd come at that, uh, and I do feel passionately. What I feel passionately about is that we have an environment where people can reach higher levels of potential. Because I feel like I've been blessed to be given that opportunity at American Express. Some people did take chances on me. There were many times early in my career I didn't feel there was a level playing field. But I always felt if I did the right thing, worked hard, worked effectively with people, you know, good things would happen in the end. And, you know, uh, and I feel like I've done great things that I never really expected to do, and a way to pay that back is to help ensure we have an environment where people can reach higher levels of potential. Because I don't know what my, I, and I, I'd say for a 165-year-old company, we certainly haven't reached our full potential. And I've been at this company a long time, and I don't feel I've any, I'm anywhere near my full potential in this company. And I want others to feel, have that same feeling. And it's, and it's not easy because there are all these inherent biases or subtle differences and, uh, and it's not, e not easy for women to break through to senior management or to have enough blacks representative at, 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 uh, at senior levels in the company or Hispanics or Asians or our pride network of gay and lesbian employees. Um, so I, I just feel for whatever reason, which I don't really understand in myself, that this really driving force to try to make, make for a level playing field, try to em, embrace the differences in people, and for me to personally try to reach out to those who I feel don't have a level playing field. Because that, that really makes me sick when I feel that it's not. And I also can see it, I can observe it. You know, I used to say um, at many times in my career that I rage against a machine, because there's a machine there somewhere. And a number of people have pointed out to me, I now am the machine. So I don't know if you can <laughs> rage at yourself. But I see you have this ecosystem, of, it's, in, it's an incredibly strong culture, but you do see there are things that happen that are just not right. And I feel when you see it, if, if I just accept and say that's the way it is, then shame on me, I'm the problem. And I never want to be part of the problem. I want to find ways to be part of the solution. And it's not that hard if you keep it top of mind. 
And I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily proud of what we've done, but I think we've made great accomplishments on a number of fronts. But we take three or four steps forward, and every now and then we take a step backward. But I think it's all about a commitment of, you know, when you have responsibility, and I don't believe, not just a president of a company or a CEO, I think every employee helps create and shape the culture of a company, and that you can own that, right? I know in American Express that's true. I felt that as a temporary employee, as a manager, a senior vice president, et cetera, that I could make an impact, and I saw it. And I was motivated by that, which is why I'm still there after all these years, that this is a place you can make an impact. And not just on the results of the company, but on the culture. Because the culture of the company is just a collection of individual behavior that occurs. And nobody, as far as I can tell, really is evil or wants to hold other groups <laughs> down. But it can happen because it's in the system and we just have to call it out. And we have to make, be a force for positive change. And at the end of the day, for senior executives, you have to sponsor people. There's a big difference between sponsorship and mentorship. Mentorship, someone comes, you have a conversation, advice, try this, think about that, don't do that. Right? But sponsorship is when you're sitting around a room and you're filling a job and you know, we're making a decision and the hiring manager says, this is the person I want for that job. And you realize it's a good person, but maybe because that, it's because they've worked for this person for a long time, they know this, but the hiring manager doesn't know this woman here, and I do. Right? Or someone else does. And you say, wait a second, right? It's not about that the person you're, there's anything wrong with the person you like, but you don't know this person, and I'm, I'm putting my reputation on the line saying we need to take a chance. So we need to have sponsors of people, and you have to be there at that moment of truth when talent discussions are occurring and when decisions about promotions and new jobs and opportunities for task forces are being created that you think consciously. Right? And the only way you can do that is before that, you have to make sure you know people in your you know, who are in the company, but maybe not in your organization. And you get to know them, and you have to reach out. Because it is like, in many ways, women in senior management, uh, or whatever group you want to talk about, is almost like an endangered species. And left to the own devices, they're going to shrink, not prosper. But it can be, it, it can be dealt with. And uh, it, you, you know, it's, it's like any other part of a job. It's, if you focus on it, you hold people accountable, you think about it, you, know, you get to a better decision. And it, I mean, when we look at where we are timing-wise, um, you know, this spring we saw businesses, US corporations, openly challenge what appeared to be anti-LGBT legislation in Indiana, I mean, Arkansas, Walmart, not exactly the bastion of diversity, by the way. Um, were you surprised by CEOs speaking out on something that 10 years ago, there's no way these guys would chat no, it is, about this? It is, well, it, I mean, I think it's, it's just definitely a sign of hope that in the past, you could say companies tried to stay neutral, right? Based on, they don't wanna take a, a stance. And by not taking a stance, you can be part of the problem. So I think you have to be, it's, and it's, it's a very, you can't take, companies really can't take a position on every social issue that's out there. But the people who work for those companies do, right? Who care deeply about different issues that are happening. So I do think we're entering a new phase here where I think companies can be a part of the solution. And you're only part of the solution if you do something. And I, you know, I have to say, you know, we have this debate within American Express. What, and the safest thing is to say nothing. Right and you know um, and and pick and choose your spots very carefully, but I think that's changing, and I I do think it's changing, I, and I think it's good. You see, sometimes companies misstep as well when they try something that really didn't make sense when you look back on it. But they're trying, they're trying to find solutions, and I think this is this is a sign that things are different now, and that more and more companies want a diverse. Uh, uh, employee base, and it's 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 a simple it's a simple formula. I think that I I saw and lived in American Express. At the end of the day, right? We're all about shareholder results. If you're a public company, you have to obsess over delivering superior financial results, or people won't buy your stock. But for a service company like Amex, the way you get that is by having customer loyalty, and we track something called Net Promoter Scores, which is a higher level than just tracking satisfaction. And when you're in a people business like we are, the only way you get high net promoter scores from customers is to have engaged people, right? So there is a business case here, right, that you can get superior financial returns if the people who work for your company feel they work for someone who cares about them, where they can 
embrace differences, they can reach higher levels of potential, they can build a career over the long term, they can get paid fairly, compensated for what they do. And the more you can connect the dots between what happens inside a company to shareholder results, I think the more you'll see companies being uh, a force for good. And oh, that, a force for good. I hope so. That's awesome. Um, before we go, uh, last question. Interesting that you ended on that note because it, you know, one of the themes today is about millennials and the way that they view financial services. And um, do you know the shift between? say, a baby boomer who really was saying, like, yes, I need a certain amount of stuff, to a millennial, like your kids, who say, I care about the value system of this organization and how social media helps promote that value system. Yeah, so, you I mean, are there differences? You think? Listen, I, th I think that maybe a difference is, like, I can only relate to myself. I certainly cared 20 years ago about the value system of the company I was working for. And in fact, that's why I'm still there. It's not perfect. And I mean, I talk about Amex in very loving terms, but I also am, can be very critical. I mean, I see in Amex pockets of, we've created a startup mentality and we're moving incredibly fast. And I see pockets of department of motor vehicles, fill out a form, wait in a line, <laughs> you're in the wrong line, get in another line, right? Uh, but I see in generally we're moving in the right direction. And I say 20 years ago, I cared about the value system, but I didn't speak, I didn't really have ways to talk about it. No, I'm talking more about the customer though, rather than the employee. Oh, do cus in, yeah, uh, because now like millennial customers care about the value well, system of the products and services. Yeah, no, that, okay, right? that's, uh, thank you, Jill. I think that's, that's a very important issue. And so I, I'd still say that people cared before, but now with the sharing economy, it's a lot more easier to get your voice heard about it, which is where I was going with employees, same thing, that I think people cared about the company before, uh, but they didn't have a way of talking about it. Now you do when you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of connections and you can share conversations instantly. Brands can live or die based on, based on, on those conversations. And you have to obsess about that, right? It's not just the, the TV commercials that you show where 20 years ago that was the message you're broadcasting. Now it's people talking about you, customers talking about you, prospects talking about you, employees talking about their company all over the place. And you can't, put a, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, so you might as well embrace it, right? And, and um, live the values of the company. But th for Amex, I feel like we've always, we've had a very good value system, which is core to being a company that has longevity. Um, but I do think we have, to, we have to have our fingers on the pulse of our employees and of our customers. And we have to make sure we can relate to them on their terms, not on ours. Uh, because the conversations are gonna occur whether we like it or not. So you might as well embrace it instead of trying to fight it. And that is a big difference now that there's so many different ways you can talk about your experiences with brands, with things you like, things you don't like. And I see, I see there's risk there, but there's far more opportunity than there is risk. I'm not going to challenge you to a soccer juggling contest <laughs> because I feel that you might actually win this one, even with your bum <laughs> knee. But I do want to um, Yes, I, tore, I had knee surgery. That's the, why I can't bend this thing anymore. I, I've than noticed that. that. Yeah. Um, but I do want to <laughs> challenge you to come back next year and tell us how all of these partnerships are going. And, um, maybe and we'll have more to talk about. Exactly. <laughs> and we always have more to talk about. So Ed Gilligan, president of American Express, thank you so thank you, much Jill. for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you all.